Joining us right now on the Board kind of Hotline for a Weinberg Wednesday. Dave Weinberg joins us live from, where are you, at the beach? No, I am at the Lower Township Elementary School watching my grandson's final t-ball game of the season. Okay, well, I was going to say, because the sky behind you looks <laughs> almost immaculate, aside from like yeah. that one cloud over your one shoulder. But aside from that, it looks great outside. So <laughs> Yeah, it's like Aruba, you know. Oh, my gosh, there's one cloud in the sky. It's a terrible day. <laughs> <laughs> So, Dave, obviously, you know, we got to start with the Eagles because they can't stay out of the news. Uh, Dallas Goddard just came out of nowhere and told the media today, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting my contract extension. It's like, <laughs> oh, all right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for just dropping that little nugget on all of us. Uh, this comes on the heels of everyone expecting Zach Ertz to get traded. So before we get to Zach Ertz, Dave, I want to ask you about Goddard. What do you think of Dallas Goddard? What do you think his potential is? Um, I'm kind of on the fence about him, uh, honestly. He um, he showed some great things the first you know couple years, but uh, there's some potential there. But he hasn't shown the consistency that you would like. Um, I, I'm not really like. I don't think he's certainly not worth a contract extension yet. I mean, you know, he's had some a couple of decent seasons. He's certainly not been uh, close to Zach Ertz numbers. So um, I think I might wait a little while before I give him some money. Now. We know he's going to be the number one tight end moving forward. And we understand that he's not Zach Ertz. He's not going to be the fluid route runner that he was. So what do you think his comparison in the league is? Because obviously, no one's George Kittle. No one's Travis Kelsey. But where can he rank? Can he be a top 10 tight end? Is he a top 8 tight end? Uh, boy, that's really that's that's kind of like subjective to to a lot of people. Some people think Kittle and Kelsey and and Ertz, I guess, were uh, among the top five. Um, I, I, he has the potential to be a top ten guy. I don't think he's there yet, though. I mean, he's he shared playing time for a lot of the time. He's been injured a little bit. Um, I'm not. I'm just not ready to to anoint him as you know the uh, the Eagles' tight end of the future yet. I mean, obviously, he's going to be. I guess. I mean, he's, but they still haven't gotten rid of Zach yet. So, um, but yeah, it looks like it certainly looks like he's going to be the guy. So he'll have a chance this year to prove if he's you know worth that kind of uh, that kind of uh, status. Now you mentioned they haven't moved on you know officially from Zach Ertz. Yes, let's get into that. To me, and I wrote about the ninety seven three ESPN dot com, Dave. To me, this is a situation where the business of sports basically fractured a relationship. You know, to me, mm-hmm. no matter Absolutely. where Zach Ertz goes, he's always going to be an eagle. I don't care who he plays for. I don't care what he does. He is and forever will be an eagle. That's because we did on the field how great he was off the field as a human being and doing charity work. And it just seems like both sides just got to a point where the money and the business aspect of the sport just totally ruined everything. And it's it's just really a shame, but it's a part of the reality of professional sports. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can't fault athletes. I guess they want to get as much as they can for as long as they can because it's uh, you know the NFL is a pretty short lived career by and large um but then again yeah i guess you, i can't blame the management for wanting to to uh be as economically um smart as they can so uh it's kind of like a uh, it's kind of a, a a problem for both sides and a benefit for both sides um but i'm i'm with you i i think it's a major mistake to to get rid of zach um I, I don't think he was asking for the world. I think he had proven himself to be an elite tight end. And like you mentioned, he's so valuable to the community. Um, and, you know, he's a great, great guy on the on the field and off the field. Lock, strong leader in the locker room, which is going to be missed. Now you've lost two leaders in the last couple of years with Malcolm Jenkins and Zach Ertz about, about to go. And I'm, I'm curious to see who's going to fill that void. I mean, they have some guys who are capable of doing it, but it remains to see if they can. So, um yeah, I, I, I just think it's a mistake to let him go, to, if uh, you're asking me my opinion on that one. Well, with that in mind, I want to ask you, because, you know, you've been covering the team now for 25-plus years, and i got to ask you, mm-hmm. because I heard I had two people tweet at me now being like, this is the worst mistake since Brian Dawkins. And I feel like the Brian Dawkins situation was not in the same – it just wasn't the same. So talk about the differences between the Dawkins situation and the Earth situation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as a, like a popularity standpoint, it was a mistake to let Brian go. And it turned out as a performance standpoint, too. But at the time, uh, Brian seemed to be like, like at the end of the road almost. And they were uh, in the process of turning everything over. 
Um, and, you know, I, I guess both sides agreed, I think, that it was kind of better off for him, for him to go elsewhere. And he had a great, you know, couple of seasons with Denver also. Um, Zach, yeah, it's, diff- it's different because I think he's still in the prime of his career. I don't think that he's – I think he still has three, four good seasons left in him. And you can't really – you can't really take much out of 2020, I don't think. Um, you know, he did, have a, he did have a down year, but a lot went into that, I thought. Um, the fact that they were not unwilling to even discuss a contact extension. He had some nagging injuries that were bothering him. The whole offense was uh, was out of whack the whole year. It looked like so. Um, yeah, I, I can see where you would think that there are two different situations. Yeah, that, you're definitely right there. Yeah, I'm mean, glad you brought about twenty twenty. I wrote about this on the website. To me, like you got to factor in the poor quarterback play. You got to factor in that he had an Absolutely. injury. You got to factor in twenty twenty pandemic impacted people different ways. Right? There, there were so <laughs> many things that happened last year that it just feels like. It, I just feel like that was an anomaly, right? You know what I mean? Like like you said, he's not old. He's not like he's 35, 30. Like people are acting like he's so old. He's, he's what, 30 <laughs> turning 31, I think he is. So it's like, it's not like he's at the end of his career. I mean, is, is there a way the Eagles could salvage? Is there a way that Ertz and the Eagles could reconcile this? Or you feel like this is just burn bridge done? Um, I don't know if it's burned, but it's definitely singed a little bit. <laughs> Um, okay. Charred, if you will. Uh, yeah, I, I keep, I keep holding out hope that they're going to find a way to 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 do this to to keep him with the team. But um, the fact that their their talks are so acrimonious and and um, he, uh, they seem so willing and so uh, anxious to get rid of him that if they brought him back, I don't know that they would have the same kind of relationship that they had the you know the first few years of his career here. Um, I would love to see him stay, but I just don't know that they could uh, set aside the emotional part of it to, along, you know, enough to, to make him want to come back. Dave Weinberg joining us here on Game Night on 97.3 ESPN. Weinberg, Wednesday, each and every Wednesday here on Game Night with yours truly, Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN. At Dave Weinberg, 19 on Twitter. Dave, a couple of things I want to hit on you outside of football uh, sure. First, I want to flip over to boxing for a moment because mm-hmm. uh, we are a about a week and change away from Clarissa Shields making her debut in Atlantic City in right. MMA with the PFL, and you know I've been really thinking about this because you know with the way boxing is going right now and the way the world is in general just going right now when in terms of you know the sports world and everything, what do you think would happen? If she is successful at doing MMA in the way that she thinks that she can, what happens to her? What happens to her profile? What happens to how people perceive women boxers? Uh, tough question. Um, I think she, she has the potential to do very well in MMA. And if she, um, you know, she's going to win this fight. I, I think they've kind of set her up for success here uh, with an opponent that's not very challenging. I mean, the, I'm sure the girl's tough, but uh, probably doesn't have the, uh, you know, the skill set, the overall skill set to, to beat Clarissa. Um, I don't know. I'm curious to see what happens with her boxing career because it's kind of, she's kind of almost accomplished everything that she can in boxing. And uh, I think maybe MMA represents a new challenge for her, some, something exciting to embrace and, and, and try and, capitalize on and i i think if she if she wins a couple fights and gets you know in position to be a contender and uh, whether it's pfl or something else then I, I think there's a real bright future there as far as boxing though i don't i'm not really sure like where she can go from here to be honest with you so what is the state of women's boxing right now because i feel like it's you talked about this before like it's so different how we look at the women's boxing arena than we look at women's mma women's mma is almost like you know, put on a pedestal the women's boxing almost feels like you got to go Go, go find the down hall corner to find them. Yeah, there was a little bit of a, a wave of excitement with Clarissa, Katie Taylor, those kind of people. But it's, uh, to me, I think it's kind of like seeing better days, women's boxing. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's just, not, it seems like everybody fights everybody. There's like four or five, six uh, women who are, you know, elite fighters. And then they, want, they just take turns fighting each other, it seems to me anyway. And um, they don't have like the depth of talent there. And, after a while, people are going to get tired of watching it, and I think you're starting to see that now. Flipping over, I saw you tweet about the Mike Tyson documentary mm-hmm. that's going on. I got to ask you, now we're only a couple episodes in, I understand that, So, but how do you feel they have portrayed 
Mike Tyson in that era? Has it how accurate has it been? Do you think they've missed anything? Have they overlooked anything? Uh, actually, I think there's only two episodes. I think they're done. <laughs> uh, okay, I thought it was more than yeah, two episodes. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think it was just a documentary on him because they seemed to wrap it up last night. I, I assume that's the way it is. Um, I don't think they really missed. Uh, I mean, they missed a few things from Atlantic City. Um, you know, his uh, tirade at the New Jersey Control Board's hearing in 1998 when he was trying to get his license back to fight. I mean, he hasn't fought. He fought. It was like his last fight in Atlantic City. It was like 1991 or something like that. Um, but by and large, I thought they did a pretty good uh, job of betraying him and and uh, the torment that's gone through. He's gone through both on and off the in and out of the ring. Um, that wasn't really that much new news to me. I mean, having having covered a lot of his fights, having you know kind of chronicled his career, I guess. Um, the most interesting part I thought was the end. It seems to like finally have come to grips uh, with everything that he's been through seems to be making a sincere a sincere attempt to uh, be a better father person um, and that, that that's important for him because I you know he's been through so much and he's been knocked down so many times both in and out of the ring that um, it's nice to see him uh, finally start to get his life together and I hope I hope he keeps doing it where does peak Mike Tyson rank? in terms of the heavyweights? Because I think a lot of people feel like when Mike Tyson was at his peak, he could have beaten almost anybody, is, is, a, is the working Bal- theory, right? But Baloney. Well, okay, well then, it's not upon <laughs> that. Cause I, to me, I don't, I don't think Tyson is... I, I think Tyson's hype might have been a little greater than his actual, like, greatness, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're right there. Um, no, no, don't get me wrong. He was a fantastic... Uh, fighter in his prime um i would put him in the top 10 i guess as heavyweights go but to, to suggest that he's like the greatest heavyweight of all time is preposterous um you know he did have he had a lot of strengths and uh but he had a lot of weaknesses as well that uh, eventually were exposed by buster douglas and then pretty much everybody else after you know the latter part of his career um so yeah yeah i i think it was like the hype just the the, the image that he had the um, the way people seem to get behind him, they, they they were so starred for an exciting heavyweight at the time, and he came in, he came along at just the perfect time. The backstory, um, the fighting style, the aggressiveness that, uh, and people just ate it up. But um, to suggest he's a, you know some sort of like top one, the top or top three, I I don't agree with that at all. Now another documentary is coming out this weekend, starting this weekend. It's called The Kings. It's going to be about um the Duran Hagler Hearns Leonard era of boxing. That's going to be on Showtime. And I'm curious, Dave, because what in your mind is the biggest difference between what boxing was in the eighties and nineties and now, like how, how do we differentiate between those eras? Those guys were the best of the best and they were, they never shied away from a challenge. They were willing to take on anybody, anytime, anywhere. And um, you saw some uh, brutal, exciting, thrilling fights among those guys that can never be replicated. I just think the sport now, I mean, you get, you know, a couple good fights a, a year, um, but none of them kind of equal the, you know, like the Hagler Hearns or, or, or um, Hagler Leonard even, I guess. Um, yeah, it's not or, or Leonard Leonard uh, Duran. Um, it's just not the same. Um, those guys were just on the on. They were five levels above anybody that's out there now. Yeah, the reason why I thought Tyson was four parts is because this uh, Showtime thing is going to be four parts. So I oh, I, I got gotcha. you. I, I, okay. I mix I mix and match my documentaries there, but it's all good because you know we're we're moving from one boxing to the. The reason why I ask you about the errors is because to me, and again, you've covered the sport more deeply. You've seen so much of the elements and the, the evolution of the game and everything. I just feel like there's so many fighters today. They, they, they just don't have, they don't have the, the, the intricate abilities that some of the fighters of yesterday had. They don't have that. They, like for example, you know, some of these fighters yesterday, even like the ones who weren't like perennial champions, they had the snap on their jab. They had the footwork. They had the fluidity. I feel like some of the fighters today are they're just they're just swingers and punchers and they're out there to get paydays. Um, well, I can't fault them too much because that's kind of what public the public 
the general boxing public wants to see. They want to see knockouts. Um, so guys kind of get drawn into that. But yeah, I think you're right. The technical aspect of, of the sport isn't as um, isn't as sharp as it was back then. Those guys were students of the game. Uh, and to Tyson's credit, so was he. I mean, you saw the clip of him at the, when he first moved in the Gusto Mato, um, you know, watching old films and, and trying to mimic their styles of Jack Dempsey, guys like that. Um, but there weren't a whole lot of guys like that left. Um, they get drawn into the hype. They, they believe their own hype uh, too often, I think. And they, they get caught up in the lifestyle and the money and uh, don't seem to be willing to, to put in the sacrifices that uh, some of those other boxers of earlier eras did. He's Dave Weinberg at Dave Weinberg 19 on Twitter. Check out all of his work, extra point columns over at 973ESP.com. And of course, the podcast, Tequila and Touchdowns with Dave Weinberg. Uh, Dave, I know Memorial Day weekend was a bit of a rain out for a lot of us. So uh, hopefully sure. this next weekend will be a little more summer like for all of us uh, as down here at the Jersey Shore. I'm with you 100%. Yeah, that was a, that was a real bummer. <laughs> but uh, uh, hopefully it'll clear up and get, uh, get sunnier and nicer and uh, we'll have more beach days in front of us. Absolutely. Dave, have a good one and enjoy the T ball game. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate it. Take care.